Hello class, I'm back. Just taking a break and drinking some water, so a quick coughing. Uh, now we're going to pick up with Burgoyne's invasion of 1777. Now, after Arnold repelled Carleton the previous fall, uh, he's going to be relieved of command. And General John Burgoyne will be put in command of this invasionary force. And he had been on board Carleton's flagship, the Maria, during the Battle of Elcor and had witnessed it, saw what was at uh, Mount Independence and so forth, so was familiar with the area, and he's going to be put in command. Now, Burgoyne is commonly known as Gentleman Johnny because he really wasn't a military man. Back in this day, if your parents were... Uh, influential in England, they could buy you a command in the British military. Burgoyne's real passion was acting. And Burgoyne was a strange character. He liked to bring all the creature comforts of home with him, even when he was in uh, what amounted to the wilderness of the Champlain Valley. Uh, he brought with him everything in the kitchen sink on this invasion. Uh, he's going to bring with him a collapsible bed and other furniture. So every uh, night when he encamps, he has his marquee tent set up that looks like his apartment in London. He's going to bring hundreds of cases of champagne and caviar and going to try to pretend like he's still in London, not the wilderness of northern New York. Now, his invasionary force is going to be made up of uh, about 9,000 British regulars. There's going to be some Canadian forces with him. There's also going to be some Indian allies and some camp followers who are wives and children of enlisted men who work for the British military and cook and do laundry and also act as nurses uh, during battle. So all told, the force, this invasionary force that's going to be on land and sea is going to be approximately 11,000 people that invade the Champlain Valley. Now, if you take a look at this handout you have a PDF of that in this lecture online that you can print out if you want to. This is all about Burgoyne's campaign of 1777. So we're going to follow along with this handout, and I'm going to explain to you what happened that summer and fall that's going to change the course of history as far as Americans are concerned. <clears throat> Burgoyne will depart, as you can see on the map, from Saint-Jean, Quebec, with this invasionary force on June 17, 1777. His very first stop will be at Point Affair, a pretty popular place back in this day and age. Uh, he stops there to encamp, gather more supplies, then continues to move south on Lake Champlain, his next big stop is going to be at the mouth of the Bowcat River near present-day Willsboro. There at the mouth, Burgoyne is going to deliver a very famous speech to his men because what's happening at that particular site, a lot of his Indian allies are rendezvousing with the British force at this spot. And this speech is really delivered to these Native American allies. And he's telling them, no matter what happens, don't take the war to the civilians. Leave the civilians of New York's Lake Champlain Valley and the Hudson River Valley, which is their next destination after Lake Champlain. Uh, leave them alone. He knows what happened to the French, uh, historically speaking, at the raid or massacre at Deerfield. And he also believes the further south he goes in New York, the more loyalists there are going to be 
and he doesn't want to alienate them. So he's really specifically telling his Native American allies, hands off the New Yorkers. Now, part of this overall strategy that you'll read about in the text and so forth, the British believe that if they can separate New England from the rest of the colonies, then they'll be able to easily wrap up the war. And the area of separation that they're looking at is sort of uh, marching a path from Montreal to New York City and separating off New England. So Burgoyne's at the northern end of this campaign. Other British forces will be south uh, in New York City who are supposed to rendezvous somewhere near Albany if their plan goes correctly, which obviously it won't. So after their encampment at the mouth of the Boquette River, their next stop is going to be at Crown Point on June 26th, as you can see on the map. From there, they're going to stage their capture of Fort Ty and Hubberton. Now, Fort Ticonderoga is pretty lightly defended, and most of the forces are right across the lake at Mount Independence, the place we talked about last lecture. That place has really been built up and it's more key because it faces north. If you've ever been to Fort Ty, Fort Ty faces south for invasionary forces coming from the south on the lake because it was built by the French for that purpose. Now in the winter of 76, 77, the brave soldiers at the Fort Ty Mount Independence military complex built a bridge across the strait there between Ty and Mount Independence so troops could easily move back and forth. It's a floating bridge that they constructed on the ice and then the supports of it sunk to the bottom when the ice uh, melded and that fort or that uh, bridge connected the military complex. Quite a feat for the winter of 76-77. I'm going to put a link to that bridge on the site when I post these two lectures. Now, uh, so what's going to happen is Burgoyne's going to send a reconnaissance unit down to check out what's going on down there. And what they discover is that the Americans, led by General St. Clair, Arthur St. Clair, has not put any fortifications up on the mountaintop that looks down on Fort Ty and across over at Mount Independence. Back in this day and age, that mountain was known as Sugarloaf. Today, that same mountain is known as Mount Defiance, and it gains its name from these actions from Burgoyne. Seeing this as a key opportunity to get the high position, Burgoyne orders a detachment of his men to drag two cannon all the way to the top of Sugarloaf Mountain, which becomes Mount Defiance, so they have superior position. Now they'll do this, and ironically enough, someone had warned General Arthur St. Clair that that Sugarloaf Mount should be fortified. That person that warned him that he should do that was Benedict Arnold. St. Clair said, no way, nobody could ever drag cannon up there. I'm not worried about it. Well, from the famous orders from General Burgoyne, he told his men, where a goat can go, a man can go. And where a man can go, a cannon can go. And those brave British soldiers dragged a cannon up there and nobody realized it was happening. You can drive to the top of Mount Defiance today by car. It's part of the Fort Ty tour. And it's quite a drive. I can't imagine dragging a cannon, hacking your way through the woods, but those men did it. Once they got the cannon up there uh, and started lobbing cannonballs into Fort Ty's parade ground, uh, on July 5th, St. Clair has no choice knowing that this huge for force uh, of 11,000 is just north of him in Crown Point, 
and orders an all-out evacuation of the Fort Ty uh, Mount Independence military complex. Now, he is going to escape across the bridge to the Vermont side. The main force of Americans will follow the old military road that travels to Castleton, Vermont, then down, down south and ultimately the rendezvous down south of Skeensboro where the actual Battle of Saratoga will happen. So they'll successfully escape to fight again another day. But it's quite an embarrassment when Sinclair has to uh, basically evacuate and surrender this site to the British with just a couple of cannon shot being fired. Now, what also is supposed to happen during this evacuation, he leaves a small det detachment of men on the Vermont side of the bridge that they had constructed. Knowing that Burgoyne and his men are on the New York side, they'll come down, find the fort empty, and go in hot pursuit of the Americans. They have rigged up the bridge with explosives, and what's supposed to happen is when Burgoyne and his men are out on the bridge, they're supposed to blow it up. Well, unfortunately, Burgoyne and his men don't make it onto that bridge until uh, late on July 6th. Those men had found a keg of Madeira wine at the fortress at uh, Mount Independence, had got bored, drank it, and were sleeping at the switch and never blew up the bridge. And they end up being captured like fools. So <clears throat> Burgoyne sends a detachment of his men in hot pursuit of the evacuating Americans. If you look at the handout, that's going to lead to the next battle that takes place at Hubberton, Vermont, the next day on July 7th. A rear guard of American soldiers led by Colonel Seth Warner, former Green Mountain Boy, will fight the British and their German Hessian allies at Hubberton, Vermont, which is on the old military Castleton Road in the middle of the Green Mountains. <clears throat> this is going to be known what, as uh, a rear guard action. Now, I've also loaded a video from the Hubberton State Historic Site that explains what happens in this very important battle uh, onto this mini lecture also. Uh, Seth Warner and his men will take heavy casualties, but they'll delay the British long enough that the main body of the army and General St. Clair can escape to the south. This is a very heroic action, <clears throat> and it's the only actual battle that takes place in the state of Vermont. Contrary to popular belief, the Battle of Bennington does not take place in Vermont, as we'll find out shortly. So the next stop for Burgoyne and his men, uh, making their way south with their target point of Albany, is Skeensboro, where Arnold built the Navy in the summer of 76. Philip Skeen, the crafty businessman, talks Burgoyne into not going to uh, the west and following a road that exists from Lake George down to Albany and cutting his own road south of Skeensboro down into the Hudson Valley. Burgoyne believes Philip Skeen for some reason that this will not be too difficult and will end up taking that route. Now, on one hand, some people consider Philip Skeen to have turned into a loyalist. The year before, he's supplying Arnold uh, to build the first American Navy, and now he's selling things and giving advice to General Burgoyne and its invasionary force. The bottom line, he's a businessman. And really, when you think about it, and he's going to be pretty instrumental in our victory, him conning Burgoyne into carving this road uh, in the Hudson Valley to 
get to the Hudson River is going to de delay Burgoyne so much, the actual Battle of Saratoga is not going to happen until September and October of 77. And uh, Burgoyne and his men are in Skeensboro by July 7th and 8th. So, uh, that's part of the reason why we renamed Skeensboro Whitehall, because a lot of people consider Philip Skeen to be a loyalist. Now, what's going to happen next are a couple of very important events. It's going to take Burgoyne forever to carve out a road through very wet, swampy land to get to the Hudson River. It's been a very wet spring and early summer. It's very muddy and it's just miserable. Now, one thing that's going to happen that's going to spell disaster for uh, Burgoyne and his men in the future is they're going to finally make it down by late July into the Fort Edward area on the Hudson. It's going to take a long time, all month, slogging around in the mud, but they get there. When they get to Fort Edward, what they're going to do, what's going to happen on July 27th, 1777, a woman by the name of Jane McRae is going to be murdered by two Native American allies of General Burgoyne's. I'll also post Jane McRae's, the famous painting of her murder, when I post these two videos uh, on the website. Now, why this is so significant? Jane McRae was scheduled on July 28th to marry a British officer. She and her family were loyalists. And remember, Burgoyne had anticipated the further south in New York he went, the more loyalists he'd encounter. Two of his Indian allies catch her when she's out running around getting ready for her wedding the next day and brutally murder her for no reason. The word of this horrible event is going to spread throughout the upper Hudson Valley and is going to turn all the loyalists who might have helped Burgoyne and his men into instantaneous rebels. This is a huge disaster for the British. Now, if you take a look at the map once again, the next big battle that's going to take place is sort of a sideshow labeled Bennington on August 16th, 1777. What Burgoyne is going to do is order a group of his men, some of these German mercenaries uh, or Hessians who are uh, a unit, what's known as dragoons, who are like a cavalry unit, to march to Bennington, Vermont, to get horses. They didn't bring horses with them on this campaign, and these men are trained on horseback, and they're sort of like fish out of water. These German dragoons wear very tall leather boots that a cavalry officer would wear, to protect against uh, the slashes of swords and brush, and they're marching in these boots. Each one of these boots weighs 12 pounds, and even heavier when they get coated in mud. So these guys are dying on this march. So he orders them to go to Bennington because there's a lot of horse farms there, and he believes that it's a loyalist stronghold, and they'll maybe give these horses to the British. So the Americans catch wind of this and uh, they're going to stop this invasionary force into Vermont before they even reach the Vermont border. The Battle of Bennington uh, with our hero once again, Seth Warner from the Battle of Hubbardton, uh, is going to take place on August 16th, actually in the state of New York, in Hoosix Falls. That's where the Americans will decisively defeat this group and stop them in their tracks, killing most of them. 
This is a huge blow to Burgoyne. Now, the Battle of Bennington, as it's known, is called that because the target uh, city was Bennington, but they were stopped before they get there. The mountaintop where the Battle of Bennington and near Hoosix Falls took place is about six miles as the crow flies from the center of the present day uh, city of Bennington, Vermont, where the big monument that I have a link to on the website is located. A lot of people think that's where the battle took place, but no, it didn't. And that's why Hubbardton is the only Revolutionary War battle to take place in the state of Vermont. So while all this is going on and all these delays, more and more Americans are gathering in the area which will become where the Battle of Saratoga takes place. Now, I gotta clear up some uh, geographic items so you're not confused. The Battle of Saratoga does not take place in Saratoga Springs. It takes place about five miles south of where a village that used to be known as Saratoga on the Hudson existed. Today, that same village is renamed in the honor of an American general from New York. Uh, that is Schuylerville, named after New York General Philip Schuyler. Now, uh, so that's why it becomes known as the Battle of Saratoga. Saratoga Springs is about, I don't know, seven miles to the west of where the Battle of Saratoga actually took place. So Burgoyne and his men are slowly but surely going to march down along the Hudson and they're going to reach where the Battle of Saratoga takes place, where now there are more than 12,000 American troops and more coming every day on September 19th, 1777. Now, I've also downloaded the video that they play at the Saratoga National Battlefield Interpretive Center on the website. I want you to watch that also. It's a very well done and important video that will explain the Battle of Saratoga to you. But to put it in a nutshell, because you can watch the video, the first battle that's going to take place uh, is going to involve our old buddy, Benedict Arnold. Arnold is stationed at Saratoga, but the commanding officer there is General Gates. Gates and Arnold do not get along, and you'll see this portrayed in this video. Now, uh, the first battle is going to take place at a place called Freeman's Farm. And in this first battle, with troops led by Arnold and also his old friend, Daniel Morgan, and his riflemen from Kentucky and the Virginia area, are going to inflict big casualties on the British in this first battle that takes place on September 19th at Freeman's Farm that you'll see in the video. <clears throat> One of the reasons why Daniel Morgan is so effective, him and his riflemen, they actually have rifles, not muskets, and they're sharpshooters. They go up in trees and purposely target British officers who you can easily spot on a battlefield, and they're shooting them on purpose, which the British object to, but it's tough luck for them. Now, uh, several weeks will go by. Uh, Burgoyne is waiting for reinforcements that are supposed to come uh, on the Mohawk River and, and from New York City, which will never arrive. And ultimately, the second and most decisive uh, battles will take place on October 7th at Bolcaris' Redoubt and Bremen's Redoubt. That's where the main force of Americans will fight the British. Benedict Arnold, who's got in an argument with General Gates, was supposed to be confined to his tent for disciplinary reasons. But when he hears the battle ensuing, 
at Brayman and Balcaris's redoubt. He'll come out of his tent, mount his trusty steed, and lead his men to victory. In that victory, Arnold will be wounded for the second time in the Revolutionary War. Remember, he was wounded up at the Battle of Quebec in 75. He's shot in the same leg that he was shot up in Quebec. The bullet will go through his leg, through his horse, kill his horse, and his horse will fall on his leg that was shot. That must have felt real good. But because of his heroic nature, his men storm the redoubts, win the battles, and then shortly thereafter, Burgoyne will be forced to march back south to the village of Saratoga and surrender to General Gates a few days later. <clears throat> so once again, Arnold is a hero. And in fact, if they had such things back in this day and age, Arnold would have received two Purple Hearts. Arnold should have had his leg amputated after that second wound, but he refused to let doctors do it. But as a result of the surgeries that ensued, his, <clears throat> excuse me, his right leg was almost two inches shorter than his left leg. And from that point forward, he walked with a very pronounced limp because of these wounds. Now, the reason why the Battle of Saratoga was so important was one thing we haven't, <clears throat> excuse me, talked about. Benjamin Franklin, our old pal, has been over in France for the last couple of years trying to talk the French into siding with the Americans and being our allies to defeat the British in the Rev War. <clears throat> the French are kind of apprehensive because up to this point, it's basically been all losses. We've had very few victories. The British have been chasing Washington around the countryside of New Jersey and Pennsylvania. They've captured New York City. Things didn't look good. But this decisive victory where we defeat this force that at its height was 11,000 men on a battlefield, lets Benjamin Franklin finally have the ammunition he needs to convince the French king into supporting the Americans. And we'll sign the Franco-American Treaty uh, in uh, 1778, and the alliance will be forged. From that point forward, the French will supply us with money by purchasing millions of dollars of Revolutionary War bonds from the unofficial American government, and they'll ultimately send British ground forces and the British Navy to fight side by side with General Washington, and they'll be instrumental in the final victory at Yorktown in 1781. <clears throat> so, Saratoga was the thing that the French were waiting for to happen before they went full-fledged and became our allies. That's why it's the turning point of the war. And who's one of the heroes of it? Our old pal, Benedict Arnold. So, that's the end of this lecture today. We've sort of wrapped up the Rev War in the Champlain Valley in the uh, Upper Hudson. Next class, we'll wrap up the war entirely. We'll talk about what happens to Benedict Arnold and how he turns from hero to traitor, the final victory at Yorktown, and then we'll move on to being our own independent nation, the United States of America. <clears throat> so, see you next time. Everybody, continue to follow the governor's order. He extended New York on pause all the way to the end of April. So, everybody needs to stay home. We're beating this thing up here in the North Country because we're staying home. So, everybody be safe. And I'll see you next time in a day or so when I lecture to you again about Benedict Arnold. Everybody take care. Bye now.